All right, so got a lot to cover. I'm a very fast talker. I apologize in advance. Um, today's talk is not going to be just me reading you the WCAG standards because I think we have all been to at least 10 of those talks at some point in our careers. Um, instead, today we're going to talk about kind of design thinking and how to think about disability at the onset of projects and um, some of the different models that we can pull in or other ones that we should really not touch at all. So we're going to talk about terminology. We're going to talk about the different models of um, disability, and we're going to talk about disabled design and um, all the really incredibly good things that disabled designers have actually brought to us. So starting off terminology, because otherwise people who have not covered terminology get real squirmy and they go, you can't say disabled. Why are they saying disabled? You totally can. We're going to cover some different language and why we're using disabled as opposed to handicap. So starting, we're going to start with handicap. So the origins of this word used to be a way to describe the slowing down of fast horses to make horse races more interesting, more even. They would actually just attach rocks to horses to the speedy ones. This was later applied to disabled people who they labeled as handicapped in the race for life. In a lot of ways, this was not necessarily the worst wording that you could use because it viewed and kind of framed it as like you were burdened by circumstance and that it is not a deficit internal within a person. Um, but the main problem with the use of these words is that it wasn't actually picked by community. It was words that were prescribed to them. Um, so over time, people have actually leaned heavily more into disabled because it didn't beat around the bush. It didn't have like weird euphemisms or patronizing language. In fact, it's actually many non-disabled people who are like, we can't say that. We can't say the word disabled. Um, they like to use words like special needs or differently abled instead um, without actually understanding the hidden ableism. In the same way that you see a lot of people who might be afraid to say the word black or gay. And I'm like, those are not bad words. You can actively say those things. People are actively identifying as that. Let's use that terminology. Um, so through the talk, I will be using the word disabled pretty heavily. Um, the other thing that I think, um, you know, that I kind of want to fight is what we really saw come out through the early aughts, which is this idea of people first language as opposed to identity first language. There was a lot of big pushes to say, you can't say that autistic person, you have to say that person with autism. That's what we consider people first language, the person with XYZ. This was a thing that was largely pushed by able-bodied folks onto disabled people to be like, no, 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 we can distance you from this. This is, it's okay. Like, we're going to view you as a whole person as if the disability is not also part of that identity. I would not say, I am a person with queerness. That's weird. Um, <laughs> so there's been, and of course it's not homogenous everywhere. There is a lot of like kind of debate within community on how people choose to identify. But by and large, we're seeing a much bigger shift to identity first language, um, where people are really owning the disability. They're like, this is a part of me. This is part of my identity. We are okay with that coming before the person. Um, by, like, like I said, it is not universally everywhere in the same way, kind of using queer as an example again. There are parts of the country who are like, absolutely not, that language is too close to slurs that were common throughout the, you know, 80s. It is person by person. If a disabled person asks you to refer to them differently, listen to them as experts on their language. Um, but by and large, this is the way I'm leaning for this talk. So, the last phrase is ableism, just to kind of cover some of the stuff that I will be using pretty heavily as terms throughout the talk. Um, so ableism, in the same way that we have all the other isms, is, you know, a practice of discrimination. It can be social. It can be physically built in. Um, most of the time, it stems from this idea that disabled people need to be fixed or in some way inferior. Um, it is, by and large, how we refer to discrimination based on disability. So now that we've got some of that housekeeping out of the way, we're going to actually talk about the modes of disability. I'm going to be covering two. We're going to cover the bad one first, so spoiler alert, and then we'll talk about how do we actually view it instead. So both of these modes kind of answer the main question of where does disability lie? We're going to start with a medical model. The medical model would say that disability lies in the heart or mind, meaning that um, if you are a wheelchair user, that the disability is because your legs are not functioning in the way that we are used to seeing legs function. They often frame things as a problem, deficiency, abnormality, um, and they often view the experts of that disability as a medical field. Um, and then they 
proposed, then the solutions are trying to fix or manage on an individual basis, whether it's through accessibility aids, some sort of medical intervention. That's the general gist. That's what most of us are really familiar with. Um, you know, if you have a hearing impairment, they're like, oh, that's a disability. Your ears are not working in the same way as ours. Um, the thing I want to note before I completely attack the, dis like, the medical model of disability is that, like, this is not an attack against doctors, right? Instead, it's a critique of the relationship of power, of who holds the power to define the disability. Is it the person with the disability or is it the medical provider seeing them? So all of the medical model, I'm going to be really critiquing that relationship of power, but not doctors themselves. You know, doctors have their own piles of ableism that they may or may not carry into practice, but by and large, very pro good medical care here. Okay. So where did this model come from? Let's talk about it because it is not a fun time. Um, we're going to go kind of through, I'd say, four horsemen. Um, I really just have three, so we're going to get rid of one of them. But <laughs> there's not as many fun biblical scaries um, that come in threes. Um, so, you know, first one is stats. I know, it doesn't sound that scary. I mean, well, maybe if you're doing them. I hate processing a lot. Stats is going to be stop number one on these uh, signs of bad times. So why statistics? It's because before the advent of statistics, the world wasn't really viewed for a normal and deviant populations. Instead, people are kind of compared against the ideal. It's a much more philosophical time. They're talking about like what the ideal man or person, I mean, of course, at the time they were saying man, but broadening it and being a little more gender expansive, like what the ideal person should and ought to be doing. By those standards, none of us are measuring up. There's kind of like one category that is purely ideological and actually impossible for any of us to reach. And then there's the rest of us in kind of category number two. So there are two categories, but by and large, everyone is kind of in the same lump here because none of us are measuring up to the ideal. But then comes statistics in the 1800s. And instead, what they say is, no, no, we are going to find the average. And you are either standard to that or non-standard, as in deviant. So you have normal populations and deviant populations, right? As opposed to ideal and not ideal, because all of us are not ideal, right? We're like, okay, guys, we're all in it together. Um, <laughs> statistics, not so much the case. No one's in it together. We are, you know, kind of fitting either within that bell curve or on the tail ends. So it recategorizes people in a different way. Next, horsemen, we're going to talk about eugenics. You know, eugenics is normally in there somewhere for most any ism, so why not here? So, they start to introduce the science of hereditary, which is disastrous. And I, for everyone, um, especially like mar like the you know marginalized racial groups at that time. Um, but instead of just saying you have normal populations and deviant populations, it kind of creates the idea of normal and inferior, right? Because deviant mm -hmm. populations could also be on the upper end, right? Like you can be an outlier on any direction, um, but it's not really necessarily assigning a worth to that, just that you're outside of that bell curve, you know? We're looking at height, so not saying like, wow, that giant over there, bad. That shorty, bad. They're just like deviant. Mm -hmm. But with eugenics, we see that shift. It is now no longer deviant and uh, kind of that normative range. Instead, it's like the baseline and inferior. So we're seeing that start to shift. And it has disastrous impacts. You see this woven into the law. Um, so there's, um, you know, a huge wave of non-consensual um, surgical sterilizations. Um, you know, so a lot of people that they're like, we don't want more of you. They're forcibly sterilizing. Um, there's a lot of institutionalizing. There's a lot of lobotomies happening during this time. It is, by and large, awful. Um, and so, let me see if I have anything else on notes here. Nope. Um, and this is kind of, sorry, one on the chart showing, showing that shift. So you see with the bell curve, we have the standard that's in that big peak, the tail ends, which are deviant. Now we're seeing superior, inferior, and then that baseline normal. That is a huge recategorization of people and how we start to view them. And we also see this woven into, um, at the time, immigration law and policy. I shouldn't even say at the time, we still see that now. They're especially, um, during one of our last pre presidencies, um, a lot of pushes for only sending us the best of the best and whatever may or may not be associated with that. So we're still seeing this kind of mirrored in a lot of modern law. So lost with the horsemen, everyone's, you know, the horsemen I think we all agree is not necessarily the best, is capitalism. How does that start to also drive the medical model for how we feed people um, with disability? 
So when we have this huge wave in industrialization, it kind of changes how people can participate with the economy. Before, when it was a lot more kind of one-off or non-standardized things, there were ways to tailor and adapt so everyone can participate in some way. Clarifying, of course, not everyone's worth is how they participate in the economy, but at least in that old model, people could find other ways to participate. Industrialization comes along and suddenly we're like, we are doing mass production here. Um, we need people who are interchangeable on the factory line. So you're starting to see this huge push for standardizing bodies. I mean, you even see this to the degree of like when I think through World War One, they were trying to standardize like suits, uniforms, cockpits, all of these things. So you can just swap in and out people to just have everything happening at a massive scale. So if you have anyone with a disability, they don't fit super well into massive industrialized like labor. Um, so capitalism is the other thing, really pushing the idea that this group is so different than other groups. And so that's really adding in and fueling this medical model. Um, so not a great time, right? We don't super love the way that like we're starting to view disability, all the things that are feeding into the idea of deviant or um, sub, right? Not a great time, but the social model. Uh, don't I wish I had the little sound effect. We lo I love the social model. This is a different way of thinking about disability. What the social model says instead is that disability doesn't lie in your body or mind. Instead, disability lies in the built world and around you. Most people are like, I don't know what you're talking about, right? Like you're like on face value, you're like, yeah, that sounds okay, and then you're like, no, hold on, I don't understand that at all. An example I like to give folks. If you see a lot of fellow glasses wearers in this room, 200 years ago, glasses were not particularly accessible or precise um, or widely available in any way. 200 years ago, like I, I can't see very well at all without any corrective lenses. I would have been considered extremely disabled. Now I have glasses, they're easily accessible. We don't really view this degree of vision impairment as a disability. It totally would have been 200 years ago. So you can see the built world around people has changed. My eyes would have been exactly the same 200 years ago versus now, but whether or not I'm disabled is completely dictated by that built world. I think, um, I don't know, I feel like this field, we often have a lot of neuro spice and a little neurodivergence um, in IT and tech. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have maybe felt differently about, um, about that identity of whether or not it's a disability or not throughout the massive year-long Adderall shortage we just had. Because I can tell you, you know, people are like, oh, are you a disabled person giving this talk? I'm like, you know, it really depends. Last year, I would have been like, absolutely yes. Um, between the job environment that was built around me, which was wildly unstructured with very few like check-ins and deadlines and all that stuff. Let me tell you, I was not a great employee last year. <laughs> built environment around me, not a great time. Lack of Adderall and support, also not a great time. Was I like, is my ADD a disability? Heck yes, <laughs> very much so. Meds came back onto the market. I found a new job. I'm like, no, this is not a disability for me. Like the subjectivity of that really changes. If someone is in a wheelchair, are they disabled? It depends. How well built is the world around them? If we look at subway, like the subway stops in New York. These are all the ones that you can access if you are a wheelchair user. These are all the other ones. This world is a much more disabled world. You can't get hardly anywhere. And so you're seeing the built environment really dictate whether or not this is a disability. We also see that in families with deaf children. The vast majority of deaf children are born to hearing parents. Yet, almost none of those hearing parents are actually learning sign language to talk to their children. Only about 40%, which is really unfortunate. So they are actively choosing in their home structure to make, um, to make their deaf or hard of hearing child only write or try to vocalize or find other means that don't actually challenge like what that hearing status quo is. So they are making their home a more, like they're driving this as a social barrier that becomes a greater disability than it ever needs to be. Not a great time. So we're seeing the built world kind of dictate how much of a disability this is or isn't. So kind of reiterating the disability and ability are often shaped by design. They are not shaped by your body. They are not shaped by your mind, but they are shaped by the design of the world around you. So now we actually look at disabled design because there is a thing that starts to happen, right? Where out in the larger context of how we think about disability, regardless of where we think that lies, what happens when people who are trying to survive a world that is not built for them, then build ways to survive that world. 
And then able-bodied people scoop it up and they go, here you go, I gave this to you. And they're like, no, no, we built it all along. So you're starting to see the things that people are radically fighting for as then being repackaged as a gift that was given to them. Okay. Right? So we see this um, when we talk about curb cuts, right? Um, does everyone know what a curb cut is? I have a little, okay. boop, one of these guys that slope down. It's often the example everyone gives of why accessible design is good for everybody, which I'll attack a little bit later but um you know that slope down they're like it's so good people with bikes people with wheelchairs people with strollers people with all sorts of things look how many people can get like move around easier when we don't have that barrier and we have that nice slope down a lot of people now are like look at this good thing we gave to disabled people it's not actually the narrative disabled people fought for this and only recently so so this was in oh i did not keep up with my papers here this was in the 70s. The 70s. It was not that long ago that disabled students in Berkeley were starting to um, like really protest. And some of that included die-ins. They would lie in the middle of the road. Like that's radical. Like that to be to risk getting hit by vehicles, lying in the middle of the road, um, pushing for um, to have like um, wheelchair lifts built into ramps to have curb cuts being added because otherwise your mobility is limited to a single block if you are navigating on your own and ideally you should be able to navigate on your own without having to ask because I mean it's okay if you can't navigate on your own I don't want to shame folks on different levels of ability but more of like we are building it in a way that no one can exist otherwise and so they're doing all these super radical really cool stuff I mean they were showing up to buildings and they occupied I think um a city hall and didn't leave for months and was actually with partnership of the Black Panther Party that all of these people were able to really, really push some radical stuff. And you're looking at people who were actively getting to bed stores, who needed medications, who needed like all of these things, staying in, you know, imagine trying to live in a building like this for several months. Imagine that too, if you also had like a lot of medical needs. It is tough, like they are badasses. And, um, and so it's insult to injury when we look at something like this and we go, look at what we gave you. It's like, no, they gave that to themselves. We repackaged it. We also see this with the Deaf President Now movement. And so you're looking at Gaudet University, which is one of the um, first deaf colleges. Um, for When they, it was time to elect the new president of the college for their seventh president, they had a hearing president, hearing president, hearing president, all the way up. And then when it came time to the seventh, they pushed for another hearing president despite several deaf candidates. And the students were like, how can you tell us that we are just as functioning and capable and able as everything else. And you continue to not give someone within our community the actual role. Um, so they were they were burning stuff in effigy. Um, if I recall, they were also taking wheels off of buses. They were parking cars, obstructing traffic. They were doing a lot of really cool stuff. Um, and now it is written into their thing that only deaf people can be president of this university. Um, but those radical pushes that like disabled communities are making um, that we then repackage as if it was something that we benevolently gifted them. So after all these pushes, we start to see the Americans with Disability Act. I'm sure we are all very aware of that. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time, but you know, that covers your civil rights laws, that covers commerce laws, and that also has industry specific things, whether that's, um, you know, planes and what sort of accommodations they need to have for wheelchairs, how much um, time is restricted online for how long you need to check out if that can be expanded, or even um, communications, which I'm sure most of us are touching now as we design websites. Um, and that is only because of like the amazing work of like radical disabled folks. Um, so now I wanna get a little specific about some of the things disabled designers have given us, um, but I'm gonna let Liz Jackson do it because she is a badass and incredible. Um, so I'm gonna play just a short clip about some of the inventions that we have to thank disabled designers for. I'm just, right, the society was frightened. They wanted the oh. things that are empathetically done for Sorry. a whole lot there less than what we're worth and the VC would feel inspiration and empathy and pat himself on the back for his good deed. So long as I have three people who aren't disabled around me, I feel like I'm going to wait for it to get to the right part. I was testing it earlier and I think it screwed up the timing. Oh, so, no. yeah, that's not super great. Hold on. Oh, and now it's saying what I'm saying instead of what she's saying. I'm doing is sort of strategically thinking about how, and this is how it always plays out in disability, right? The things that we radically fight for turn into things that are empathetically done for us. It makes me think about National Adapt, right? So in Denver in the early 1970s, there was what is called the Gang of 19. And it's 19 people, 19 disabled people who had escaped 
institutions. And this was the first time. This is not the timing for the clip. I'm so sorry. I'm going to skip ahead before I spend too long here. Sorry about that, because it's a 20 minute thing and trying to hunt down the exact time stamp. What I get for trying to be proactive about my technology and um, so instead I'll just recap what she said much better. Um, touch screens, disabled communities. It was someone with carpal tunnel who was like really feeling a lot of pain and trying to type created this. And then Steve Jobs bought out the patent and said, you're welcome, everybody. I'm a genius. <laughs> he didn't create that. Audiobooks. Those are largely from blind users who um, who pushed to have a way to engage with written text. And that was in the 1930s. So I would also credit them probably with podcasts. <laughs> text to speech, the foundation of Siri, largely, um, that was largely um, text to speech, blind communities, um, doing a lot of like texting, TTY, stuff like that. Um, hearing aids, hearing aids are big, big, big. And the reason why is because they scaled everything down. A lot of disabled people were tiny, like tired of getting these monstrosity, like massive, massive, massive hearing devices. So they're like, I can't actually live with this. They really pushed for everything shrinking, which was the foundation for um, microcomputers. And so instead of having a computer that would take up this whole room, like a lot of that foundational starting tech was all from hearing aids. Um, curb cuts, we already went over that. Okay, this should start at the right time. So. I like to also highlight disabled design because it is a different way of thinking. Um, and also after we'll kind of talk about why um, universal design is not always possible. But so this is going to be from Goddard University of what deaf space looks like. Take a walk around the Gallaudet University campus and there's evidence everywhere of its 19th century roots. But the university, which is dedicated to deaf and hard of hearing students, is also at the cutting edge of inclusive architecture. Gallaudet's architectural team believes small design flaws can accumulate into significant barriers for the deaf community. So, for example, doorways. If you're walking and having a conversation with a friend and you have to stop that conversation to open a door with a handle, you've now created a barrier. So that conversation has to stop to even enter a building. And that can also be a barrier in terms of remembering what you are even talking about. Simple features like wider automatic doors can help solve problems like that. It's all part of an architectural movement called Deaf Space, design focused on what works best for the deaf community. With staff and students communicating in American Sign Language, open spaces create opportunities for long distance conversations. This space really demonstrates the importance of line of sight. I could be having a conversation in American Sign Language from here on the top floor with somebody all the way down there on the ground floor. One drawback, of course, is that private chats can easily become public. Communicating through hand movements can also strain your eyes, so deaf space designers are careful with how they use light, color, and patterns. So, for example, you see the two colors behind me. The upholstery is one solid color as opposed to designs. So that design would be considered what we call visual noise, something that's checkered where you have a lot of things that are competing with your visual attention. We try to reduce that so it's not as busy, as noisy as we call it. Gallaudet's architects say they learn something from every single new building. So more than a century after the death of its founder, this university is still creating the perfect environment for deaf or hard of hearing students to excel. Giles Gibson, CGTN, Washington. Which is pretty awesome design, but also if you are blind, that is pretty awful design. <laughs> the reason why is by making a lot of clean visual sight lines, um, a lot of people who are blind who are using auditory cues to navigate, it is a cacophony. Um, so one of my friends who is blind often complains about this in restaurants and even just places where he's trying to walk around because he'll often wait to listen to gaps in traffic of like when it goes quiet and you're like, okay, I can cross. And of course he's also using a dog and not just like hopping on in. Um, but now it's a cacophony of noise. We actually see this in a lot of like big shifts in restaurants where you used to have those big tall booths that were clunky and very 90s and you know, I kind of miss them, but most people were like, heinous, get rid of it. But as a result of opening that up 
you know, a lot of waitresses were appreciative because they could see really far away if their tables needed something. There were long, like, lines of sight. But as a result, the average noise in a restaurant has gone up about 10 decibels. Oh. You know, so you're looking at physical space being designed differently and impacting different groups differently. So, there's a lot I can say about this. As you can tell from, uh, we're on slide 37. I'm a big fan of slides. We've got more slides on it. But <laughs> the main thing I want you to take out of what we just covered is that you design with and not for. We're not trying to like pay, like have that patronizing, like I've made this for you. Also because disabled designers have consistently and continually proven some incredibly strong de design chops that I think are probably vile and beat most of ours because you are constantly designing to fit into a space not built for you. So what does it look like when you're actually designing with? Right? You're, maybe you're launching a new website, a new app, and you want to do not the crappy thing of saying, oh, ADA compliance, that's a line item on the end, we'll just kind of passively throw that in there. Right? What does it look like when you're actually thinking critically about disabled design? One is making sure it's disabled, dis like disabled led at the onset. So key things here, onset, at the start, they're not just user testing at the end after you spent several months making whatever potential monstrosity you've made. You're doing it at the onset and also disabled led. Right? So you're not designing for, you're designing with. And so, and that also doesn't mean that you're just saying, hi, is there anyone disabled who would like to give their in, like voice to this for free? Like, we don't want to compensate you, <laughs> even though you totally have an expertise that we don't have. Right? You have to make sure they're fairly compensated. You also want to think critically about that compensation. So if you are consulting with dis uh, disabled people and they are on state benefits, um, the, sh the legal structures that surround that are incredibly oppressive and bad. Um, currently where it stands, and there is some talk of trying to change this, although it's still pretty bad, is if you are disabled, you cannot have more than $2,000 in your savings, otherwise you lose your benefits. Tell me how you're supposed to save for the first of the month and have any money in your account and be able to do anything like that. How you're supposed to pad for, how could you even save for a car? Like you can't, it is like compounding injustice. Um, so you're hiring disabled designers. Some are on benefits, some are not. You want to be critical about how you're choosing to compensate. So some might want to be paid in non-taxable things um, or not things that aren't rated as income. And so it might be gift cards. That might be other things or tangible supports. Um, you can always list within um, any, any things that you're trying to hire that you can pay in several different ways, depending on what the candidate's desires are. Um, because it would be, you know, like that is a limiting factor a lot of people don't think about. Um, also, I mean, this just mirrors in kind of compounding um, things. If you're working with poor people, like the maintenance of benefits can be life or death. You're probably not paying them enough to justify losing housing security. So things to consider depending on the demographics you're surfing, like servicing and working with is really thinking critically about the compensation and making sure their labor is compensated in a way that is not um, actually dangerous to their livelihoods. So second, goals have to be specific with determined metrics. I We have seen this everywhere of how many times at the start of something they're like what are our goals for our org and they might say we want to be more diverse what does that mean right that's a fun buzzword what does that mean sometimes like when you often don't define it well if maybe it's like you want more diversity does that just mean that everyone who's lower ranked is more diverse but all of the power is still held by probably white men right at the top it doesn't quite look like diversity to me does it look like having leadership pipelines and training? Does it look like things like that? So in the same way, disability work needs to be specific. Are there groups you are trying to target and hit? Because if you're like, we want the space to be built for disability. I mean, as I just showed you, okay, are we talking about deaf people? Are we talking about blind people? You know, if someone has poor vision contrast, they might want these lights super duper bright in here. But someone else with sensitivity might be like, no, that's going to trigger so many migraines, so many whatever. You need to be specific about very tangible goals that you're trying to reach and um, really knowing why. So make sure it's a good metric and to actually gauge it and to hold yourself accountable for doing this. Also, I really hate one size fits all. You know, so we talk about curb cuts. That is always the thing that people champion is like, look, when you include disabled design, it's good for everyone. Frankly, I don't give a shit if it's good for everyone. Why does it have to be? Why do you able-bodied people have to say, unless there's a benefit for me, I don't think we can do this. It's okay if something is built specifically for disabled people. That is okay and actually probably really great, right? It doesn't need to be for everyone. It is one size fits one. 
You can custom tailor it, you can design it. It does not need to serve some greater institutional good all the time designed with disability in mind, right? Um, I guess the way, I mean, I often use other identities as a means of illustration, knowing that identity is not interchangeable and marginalization is not the same. But if someone was trying to do queer initiatives, it's like, how absurd would it be if someone was like, but how does that help the straight people? We'd all be like, that's terrible. No, thank you. But we do this with disability all the time. Next, you got to make the, like, you have to really question, is the co-design process accessible? Right? So you're like, maybe you hire a super badass disabled designer. Great. They are compensated. We love that. They're at the start of the project. Fantastic. And you have metrics you were trying to hit. Amazing. But are you setting them up for failure? Because a lot of people are like, we tried that and it didn't work. So now we're never going to do it again. But it's like, why didn't it work? Is it because of the person or is it because of the world that you built for them to collaborate? Are meetings offered in hybrid? You know, I mean, right now there's very few masks in this room. A lot of immunocompromised people are not able to be here because of that. You know, um, is the like, is the office a physical location without means of getting in? Sometimes you're like, oh, no, we have an elevator. That's great. Are your aisles wide enough that a wheelchair can actually fit through? Are you telling these people beforehand or is that on them to have to ask and call and be risk seeing, like having to weigh, like, am I going to be the annoying one? Is this going to hurt my, because like who holds the power in that higher dynamic? And you're constantly putting the onus on the marginalized group to have to like fight for their ability to manage. And a lot of people choose not to because they're afraid of the optics. Um, so is, is the location also in a time that they can access, right? So if you are someone who are not, is not able to drive and you're asking for a meeting when buses don't run, you know, are you having them show up three hours beforehand? Because that's the only time bus, like the bus isn't running. Are you thinking about that? You know, I mean, this is once again, using another identity as an example, but I was doing community coalition work and um, we were trying to pull the community um, to really get some ideas of public health work that we were doing. And we were meeting at town hall and um you know i was i was there at, after that but um you know one of the things that was raised is people were like one you're meeting at a time that everyone who is paid to be here can meet everyone else is trying to show up after their jobs because they can't afford to take that without pay um so it's like yep sorry we have to inconvenience ourselves which is important to be able to have a 7 p.m meeting after the kids are home and fed and whatever second we were doing this at town hall which is notoriously known for being heavily policed People of color were not attending those meetings. Why would they? I wouldn't. Um, and so like, where are you meeting? Is this accessible? Are you actually trying to meet with the people? Like if you're hiring someone, are you really thinking about their ability to engage? Are you sending over the materials in an accessible way, both in terms of like the documents and like the ability to be read on screen or it's the time it might take to process them? Um, it, is there that time for engagement and like how much, you know, how, how thoughtful are you being about this? You know, there was someone last year when I ran this talk, who was like, yeah, you're focusing a lot on um, physical disabilities, you know, of like, is it screen reader accessible? Is it this and that? They were talking about a project where they were trying to work with, I believe, children with Down syndrome um, for something about fire safety, whatever it was. They were trying to do focus group testing and um, building up trust in a relationship is really like they were finding difficult within that community that they were like, we don't trust strangers. And so they came in and they're like, yeah, we didn't get anything out of that meeting because they didn't know who I was. So they're like, so it was kind of a failed attempt. They're like, so what about that? We tried. And I was like, okay, but why wasn't it built in to even just have like five sessions before that, to hang out, have pizza, play video games, like building that relationship. You're seeing a barrier and you're doing nothing to address that barrier. Like how much are you building this in? You know, when I was doing work with Fish and Wildlife Service, trying to work with a lot of like indigenous tribes, they were like, you have to do relationship building. You have to like probably pad in at least six months to a year and you can't have interchangeable staff. You have to have someone who's consistently working because the distrust in the government was so rightfully high that it is very interpersonal dynamic based. And so for the first half of your meetings, don't even bother setting an agenda, it is listening and learning and building relationship. That is also part of this process. So the last thing, which I think is a fun one because it also says the word dongle and that's fun. Um, <laughs> so avoid disability dongles and I have some spicy examples for them. What is a disability dongle? It's normally well-intended. We love that. It's normally elegant. You're like, ooh, such fun technology. And it's useless. They are absolutely useless most of the time. They're solutions to problems that able-bodied people identify. They're like, we see this. We will tell you what your community needs. And you're like, okay, but maybe just listen to the community. Um, they're often really cost prohibitive and they rarely make it to market. So we see a lot of like robotic arms for um, like, 
for people who have limb amputations. And they're, they're, these robotic arms are heavy. They're expensive. Insurance rarely covers them. They can be 70000 apiece. Um, the batteries will often die. The amount of videos of people on, like, di like, disabled Twitter who are like, my arm died on the microwave and now I need to run an extension cord to charge it to, like, go and retrieve my arm. Um, <laughs> things like that. They're like, they're like, we literally, like, they're like, can we just have some low-tech solutions? Can we have something that adapts to, um, to our limb and then have them interchangeable? Like, I just want to pop a whisk on it. I just want, can you just make me a whisk that walks in here so I can stir? They're like, we're really not looking for a lot. They're like, I want to work out. Can you just make it so it can hold a weight? I just want to hold a kettlebell. Can you do that for me? And so, which is why you often see people with lower tech things. But instead, everyone's like, no, no, we'll solve your disability with science. And everyone's like, please listen to us, right? Um, and these things rarely make it to market. They make these big, splashy press releases, and then they are abandoned and go nowhere. So examples... This adaptive deodorant that you can hold and open it without hands. Um, so you can kind of just like hold it, twist it. You see the braille on there. There's all these different ways. It's supposed to be more accessible. They announced this in 2021. Um, they got a huge, huge splash of like nice press features, like design awards. About a year later, they abandoned it. They are still getting design awards for this. A product that has never made it to market. Stuff like that, you know. Um, things like this. How terrifying to, and some of them go backwards. Who would like to go backwards down the stairs? <laughs> Little scary. Really expensive, incredibly heavy, and just difficult to use. Um, so, like, this is the type of disability dongle that everyone is like, oh, like, all the able-bodied people are like, technology is saving humanity. Isn't this amazing? And everyone is like, can you just give us a ramp? <laughs> can you please just give us a ramp? That's all we want, you know? Um, and instead they're like, but don't you want this terrifying piece of machinery that is actually like horrifying to think about and use of like this really steep incline? You're like, I don't want to climb that. I don't know. Thank you. And I also don't want to drop hundreds of thousands of dollars. Like literally some of the price points come up to that. Um, so nope. But instead we're like, no, we will make it on you to make the world around you adaptable instead of us making the world better. Um, we make it an individual problem as opposed to a collective one. Um, this, has anyone seen this? This was making the rounds on the internet about a year ago. Yeah. It's the ASL glove? It's the ASL glove. <laughs> um, people were like, isn't this awesome? Um, it's not. <laughs> um, <laughs> you might need to use it. You can sign the ABCs. You can sign the basic letters um, in ASL and it will translate them into text. Does anyone think it is equal communication if everything I'm saying now, if I just letter spelled to you, every <laughs> single word that we just covered? No, not at all. Um, it is useless, but got a lot of rewards. Um, the other thing about it is who is it putting the onus on to be able to communicate? It's deaf communities that is like, oh, you want to talk to us? Okay, you, you meet us where we're at as opposed to us doing collectively anything better. You know, um, so for instance, one of the things that's very easy Anytime you're giving slides, like, literally, please put closed captioning on. Make it more accessible. That took me, uh, I held down three buttons, and it was there. There is stuff we can be doing that I have not to attack other presenters. But, you know, give them a nudge if they're presenting again. Say, hey, can you put some closed captioning on? Um, stuff like that. And instead, they're like, no, but can't people just use the glove? Can't people do all these other things? And the answer is no. Um, they are just they're bad tech. Um... This kind of reiterates what I just said, that is up to the deaf person then who must continue to contort and like move away from really easy means of communication to just fit us. Um, here's an example I, I like to think about a lot too. If anyone's designing a home anytime soon, the way disability works or like disabled design, thinking of your social environment is seeing it everywhere. When I think of doorknobs, because I'm renovating my house, which has been very expensive, but I'm trying to design it so that way if I become disabled in the future, um, I want to be able to not have to change everything. So let's look at the round doorknob. We're pretty used to those. That's a lot of precise movement, grip strength, fine motor skills to twist and turn and open it. The handle, I can booty bump that boy. I can use my elbow. If my hands are full of groceries, I can open that so easily. I will say, though, thinking critically about your design, if you have a big dog, do not put this handle because your dog can't open the door. Yes. Um, but if you don't have a dog, think of your built environment. Like, once you start thinking of the social model of disability and really living it and not just in your projects, you start asking different questions. You start, I mean, you'll see it everywhere. I mean, even outlets that have 
soft lighting built in. So you're like, I can see the floor better now. If you have a two-year-old at home who is learning to walk, I don't know, is that when kids learn to walk? I don't know. I am childless. <laughs> but like railings are so easy to put in few screws into some studs. Now they have something at coasting height that they can hold on to and you can continue to adapt that, right? Like there are ways that we can make the built world around us smoother and more easy. Um, and once you start seeing that, you start seeing it everywhere in design where it's failing and you can start actually pushing to advocate that. Of like we're adding a new office. Are the doors wide enough for people to get in? What type of seating, right? If anyone now I'm going to, I'm going to bustle fast. So we hopefully have time for some Q and A, right? If someone now asked a question and there was anyone who was hard of hearing, they can't actually look and try to read those lips. So that circular classroom design is really important. So thinking really critically, whenever you're at the onset of something, how do we design this? Right. And that comes back to the onset thing. Cause otherwise, once you have your blueprint specs and you have all of that and you pull someone in at the very end and go, what do you think? Did we do a good job for the community? And they go, absolutely not. It's too late then to really pivot in a meaningful way. So, the last thing I have to throw at you are some resources. This is one of my favorite websites, um, Critical Access. Um, so Critical Access talks, like it really critiques a lot of the ways that we talk about disability in ads. Um, and so when you click on any of these little buttons, it will show you ads that fit or don't fit into it, right? And so you can kind of see if you're like, you know, those things we're used to seeing, we're like, oh my God, so inspiring. And they're like, okay, it's not, and this is why. And so like, how do we talk about disability? How do we think about it? How do we shift our perception around it, right? Um, and so like, they have, you know, the idea of surprise, the surprise reveal, right? Like there might be things that touch on a few of these gift recipient. They had an example of an athlete who I believe had cerebral palsy, who was like a runner that they were like, oh, he's going to be in um, the Special Olympics. Like, let's give him a contract deal and so they they all showed up and they gave a big announcement they had a film crew after like some local race he was running and they made it they're like surprise we're giving you a contract when you see other athletes get contracts does it ever look like that when you see like a high schooler at a basketball game who's getting like poached for the um nba no they meet they have their lawyers talk about stuff they have a scheduled appointment and especially that video i don't think they let that um that runner speak at all they spoke over it. So he also was being removed a voice. And everyone's like, oh my God, that's so inspirational. Isn't that lovely they gave him this? And you're like, oh, I feel like you're only saying that in the most patronizing way. <laughs> like, because no one else, like if I received a job offer that way, if I received, like I would be disgusted. Like you're like, that's act it's incredibly patronizing. So this pulls in some really amazing examples. So you can start to think about disability in a different way. Um, we don't need a recap. Let's skip that. Here's some other stuff. Curb cuts. So, uh, this is a podcast feature from 99% Invisible. They talk a lot more about um, those Berkeley protests, which were amazing. Crip Camp, it's on Netflix. It talks about like the occupancy of a lot of those buildings, the partnership with the Black Panthers, all that cool radical stuff. If you're like, man, I want to see some disabled badasses, there are a ton of them in that. Um, when disability in tech is just a marketing exercise. <clears throat> degree. Um, <laughs> there's some really cool examples here. There's a really great, um, I can't say Twitter thread anymore, X thread um, by this research, like this disabled PhD student who um, is where I pulled a lot from the medical model of disability. Um, brilliant, really deep analysis. Uh, you know, I'm just gonna, you can just screen through. Yeah, that's all of them. So I'll let you take a little picture there. Um, and the last two things I have are two books, and that's Making um, Disability Modern, so a lot of design histories, where the harms have come from, how they've improved, um, how we don't make disability dongles, and then hearing happiness, um, the idea of having to cure deafness. Um, and so there's some really interesting stuff there as well. So I think we have, oh, this clock sucks. It's gotten more out of sync. I think we have maybe five-ish minutes for questions, so... Hit me with them. Or don't. It's fine. Yes. <laughs> what three buttons did you press to get your closed captions? So on Mac, it is um, Command, Shift, C. Thank you. I don't know what it is on PC. But, um, well, I'm doing a talk tomorrow, so I'll do it tomorrow. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, I just wanted to, because there was a idea that came in when you were talking about the eugenics point of the origins of the medical model it sounds like statistics oh it sounds like statistics came in 
to be like, oh, let's analyze this, but eugenics weaponize statistics. Is that yes. a good way to summarize it? I would say so. Okay. And something I should remember if I give this talk again. Mm -hmm. Yes, very succinctly <laughs> said. Um, yeah, they all kind of just continue to build on each other. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Yes. Uh, what are some uh, like gaps in the uh, design that, like, uh, for certain disabilities that are not widely uh, implemented that like would be useful to be implemented? Uh, some of them. I mean, so there's a lot, and it really depends on what disability. I think what is currently becoming incredibly, I I shouldn't say trendy, but we're seeing a re like a kind of surgence of awareness um, is like neurodivergence yeah. um, because it is incredibly popular, and I believe like. It's hard to say if rates of ADHD and autism are rising or if they're just being appropriately diagnosed. Right. You know, a lot of these things. Probably a mix of both. Right. Probably a mix of both, right. Like, these things have always been there, but um, we often don't diagnose them. And there's also, like, huge bias, um, especially women present um, symptomology differently. And so um, a lot of the time um, it is only disruptive, codified disruptive behaviors that are diagnosed. So there's a lot of people lacking diagnosis. But um, that is a lot of social um, social stuff, structurally, it could be more meeting, like more over um, deadlines. Sorry, I'm going to get a little rambly because my Adderall is wearing off right now. <laughs> um, let me recenter here. <coughs> to, I guess, most simply put some of the things that I think would be a big social challenge and really valuable for a lot of, um, of workplaces or any, any system is making the implicit explicit. And so for a lot of neurodivergence, you know, like I have a friend who is on the spectrum who when someone says, get this to me as soon as possible, she's like, oh, my God, they really mean as soon as possible. And she'll pull an all nighter, like cranking out work. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not what they meant. But that's what she heard. And so like it's like, no, no, let's be explicit. Like that clarity is valuable, I think, for everyone of like being like, can you get this to me by next Friday? It's a much clearer prompt. Or the social norms. I'm starting, a, I'm in a new position right now and sharing space with other people. And so the first thing I did when I got in there, was like, hey guys, can we talk about what our expectations are if one of us is on a video call and the other people are still here? Do we, it's a big property. Do we like kind of leave the room? What is the privacy expectations? Can we talk to each other and socialize? Or do we want to have like, do we want to purposely block explicit quiet times of focused attention? And so, like, I'm like, can we just talk about it? Because, like, I have bad impulse control and I will just talk your ear off. I'm like, can we just talk about, like, what we need before we actually have friction? So I think that's a big thing that is often, I guess, understated or viewed differently, but making things incredibly explicit and having a culture that supports that. Um, it looks like, okay, we're right at time. I might be sneaking and let one more slide on. Oh, there's two people. Okay. Uh, well, I was just going to ask um, if you have any like suggestions for resources for advocating for um, just different accessibility. Uh, to... That one's harder because I I have just feel like I've I mean a lot of my friends are disabled and I just feel like I just am a sponge holding everything where I'm like well, they told me about this thing so now I'm going to bring it up so one of it is I think like just engage more with like. You know, you don't want to just say, hi, I need a disabled friend to teach me about this, right? No one wants to be tokenized in that way. But jump into, like, disabled Twitter. Start to, like, look at design forums. Start to look at, like, what the actual critiques are. Um, so that way when you see something posted, like that stupid glove, that you're like, oh, what are the actual critiques? And you can start to learn about it better and think about it better. And I think when you start to switch to the social model, you'll start asking questions differently. Um, you know, instead of just like, what does WCAG say we need to do? As a, Instead of like, okay... How would a deaf person navigate this? How would a blind person navigate this? What about someone who has slower processing time? Maybe it shouldn't be a time to check out. Or if it is a time check out, can we have some sort of extender? You know, things like that. Um, you know, I think like learning how to ask better questions and then just steep yourself in disability culture as much as you can. I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna just take yours so that way you're, I don't wanna leave you out. Your question? Uh, I was wondering if there, if you agree that people kind of categorize people as like how autistic you are or like how deaf you are, and if you oh, they totally you. do. It's um, and it's really interesting um, because they're doing it based off of your ability to fit to fit into cultural norms, which is a really shitty metric, right? Um, and you're like, well, those norms are the built environment around you, right? So I have um. I was talking to someone recently who has two friends who both have very similar disabilities of like really extreme chronic fatigue. 
One of them is from an exorbitantly wealthy family who, I mean, is sitting on a trust that is making them more money than any of us will ever make. I have my own feelings about that. The other one is not. Um, so with the one that is, we're like, how, what is the degree of disability when you don't need to work and you can opt out of capitalism and you can rest when you need to rest versus the other one who has to cr like constantly push through and work. And it's like creating extreme pain for them. And, you know, and so when people start to measure disability on a scale, they're not measuring of like, they should be measuring the societal padding on a scale, not the individual of how they think they're lining up or not lining up. You know, instead, if they're like, oh, this person seems seemingly, quote unquote, more disabled, they're not saying, oh, maybe our environment is more disabling, you know. So anyways, I want to be conscious for the next speakers and give them time to set up. So hope you guys value this.